beautiful Temecula, California, although it's kind of hard to tell from this parking lot here, is traditionally known as Southern California wine country. However, in this business setting, a craft distiller has taken root. I'm George Maurer, and welcome to Gentleman Boozer. I found out this was a family heritage that my family's had going on for over 280 years. We could trace back to 1731 in County Cork, Ireland. California Distilleries carries on 300 years of history for the Tiller family. Some legal, some illegal, then throw in a little inspiration from an issue with a very modern name post-traumatic stress disorder from eight hard years as a San Diego deputy sheriff. So I dealt with a higher uh, level of inmates, um, especially, um, and most of them with mental illness. Uh, and I got attacked a lot, and they ended up retiring me for PTSD. He's the one that said we wanted to do this, and my dad told him at first, no. He took it as drunk talk most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thought it was too hard. Um, however, Billy did a lot of research and he came to me and said, hey, I think we only need, you know, this license and this license and this license. My brother spent, uh, I want to say, close to two years researching and talking to a couple other distilleries and other people. My dad had no other option than to say, okay. <laughs> so he was locked in at that point. At that point, he was completely locked in. found out there was a lot of people that didn't understand what clean alcohol tastes like. Now there's three parts to distilling. The first part that comes out is what we call heads. That's methanol. Methanol is not good for you. It is not something you want to drink. It has actually been believed to actually cause blindness and death during prohibition. Now the second part as this continues to heat up and at about 173, 175 degrees, ethanol evaporates. That's what we call hearts. That is the stuff you do want to drink. That is the good pure stuff. Okay, the third part that comes out is what we call tail. So you're gonna have acetones, carcinogens, fossil fuels, a lot of that stuff that's gonna still be left behind. If you ever open up a bottle of alcohol from a grocery store or any place like that, you open it up and it makes you shiver, it smells like fingernail polish remover or a hospital, that means there's probably a good amount of tail still left behind. I tell people all the time, if you open a bottle of alcohol, I don't care who makes it, if it smells like a hospital, you might wanna think twice before you drink it. One very common question, what exactly is the difference between bourbon and whiskey? Bourbon, in order for it to be considered a bourbon, has to be a minimum of 51% corn. Um, we don't use the minimum. My dad is very much into the traditional way that whiskeys used to be made, which was closer to 75 and 85% corn. So that's what we use. So we use that 75 to 85% corn, and you get a lot more of that flavor profile when you do it as well. What makes your bourbon special? So we're a little bit different. In order to put your legally put your um, corn whiskey in the barrel for aging, um, the highest proof you can put it in is 129.9 uh, proof. Most people do that because you're only allowed to use a bourbon barrel one time in order to call it bourbon. You have to, you're not allowed to reuse them. Um, so to save volume amount, they put it in at that high proof and then after it's done aging several years, they cut it down with water. I think you lose a lot of the flavor that way, um, so I sacrifice the quantity for the quality. I put it into the barrel at proof. While bourbon may be California Distillery's flagship spirit, that's not the way it began. Well, originally, when we first started this, we were going to do the flavored drinks. The apple pie moonshine, the lemonade moonshine, the peach pie moonshines, and those kind of things. Whose Behind brainstorm that, was that? That's my dad, and that comes from his growing up in Texas and him learning on the farms with his grandfather and his father, and pretty much they just learned to do that all year long, and it all depended on whatever fruit or whatever was in season at the time. And when I say fresh is because we don't want the stuff that's picked a couple of weeks before it's ripe, right? We need it ripe. 
So when we squeeze it, you get the fresh, because there's a difference between real fresh ripened and stuff that's been sitting around turning the right color or however it is you want to make it. Is this like a lemonade? This is our lemonade. Yes. And it's made from, from fresh squeezed Myers lemons from Temecula here. And I know because I was here and I squeezed a lot of myself. <laughs> So good. Makes it it's dangerous. dangerous. That yes. is super good. It's very rare. I'm in the construction business, so it used to be old school. You would, you can tell a craftsman when he did something. It's like, yeah, I did this. I like coming in here because when you taste their product, they're they're proud. I made this, and it's like, wow, you don't get that. You, you don't get that anywhere anymore. Talk to your daughter a little bit earlier. You know, obviously she's one of the few female distillers around. She's uh, probably the only legitimate real distiller in the state of California. And she's probably one of a handful in the country. Um, when they started the process, it was pretty much just my brother and my dad. And then um, my mother and I came in and we were helping out with the paperwork. They stuck us behind the computer. Me and a computer didn't go so well for very long. <laughs> Kind of a little bit hyperactive. I like to be in the field, hands-on, doing things. Um, so pretty much what ended up happening is I started saying, and being a little vocal, saying, hey, you know, I think I want to know how to distill. I want to learn how to do this. Why does it have to be just boys? She has become a really, really good distiller, and actually my dad and I are pretty proud of her. She uh, is the first one in our direct line of uh, father teaching son, father teaching son, all the way back to the 1700s. Um, that we know of to be the very first female distiller in this family. And she's, for the last, I guess, coming up on two years almost, has been making everything back here by herself. Now, in my experience, women tend to be a little bit better at attention to detail <laughs> stuff. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find that true Absolutely. in the distilling process here? Absolutely. Uh, women tend to be, especially for myself, I can speak for myself and my mother, we're very um, anal and we are very much more attentive to the small details and how everything's supposed to be. Um, we don't half ass do anything here. Everything is done till it's done perfectly. And there has been times that we've legitimately had to go back to the drawing board and start the process all over again because it wasn't perfect. Uh, who's a better distiller? You? or your brother? Oh, me. <laughs> Please. <laughs> me all the way. <laughs> your sister said she's a better distiller than you <laughs> are. Yeah. <laughs> of course, and I'm sure if you ask Billy, he'll say he's a better distiller. <laughs> so, but, uh, well, Billy said they, they, they kind of, they play off of each other a little bit. You know, he will go to her for things, she'll go to him. So they, there's definitely a little competition there, but also a little bit of camaraderie as well. Well, they're brother and sister, they're siblings. So there's always gonna be, they're close together in age. Their entire life, they grew up competing against each other. Amazingly, one fairly new member of the family may be the most responsible for launching the entire operation. She's a PTSD service dog provided by K9 Guardians down in Fallbrook. Um, the company Chive Charities uh, donated the money for me to have her. Uh, she, she takes care of me when I'm out in public. I don't do very well surrounded by too many crowds um, when I'm outside, so she'll walk a circle around me, prevent people from getting too close. If I have to sit at a bar like mine with my back to the door, I kind of freak out. She'll sit next to me and uh, alert me of people coming in or coming up behind me. Uh, she wakes me up in the middle of the night for nightmares. It's pretty cool. I noticed uh, right before we were getting ready to shoot this interview, you looked a little nervous. She came over to you. Yeah, as soon as uh, she can feel my anxiety rise. So she'll come in uh, to help me calm my nerves, uh, break anything that I have going out. Because I tend to observe everything around me and my brain's going a thousand miles a minute and I'm watching everybody's hands. And, She'll come and she'll lean against me and cause me to break my concentration. And she's like, hey, I'm here with you, so. So did she help you uh, relax a little bit for this interview? She did, she always does. And as you can see, she keeps an eye on me. 
she starts to freak out if she can't see me and she'll start going to look for me. So it was it's pretty amazing when I actually got her from Canine Guardians. I didn't realize how much a dog could, but I was completely barricaded in my house. I didn't want to come out. Um, didn't like being in public. So she's helped me overcome a lot of stuff. When she arrived, you came back out into the world and helped get this business started. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's exactly. She keeps she takes good care of me. So.